It's time for the Love and Hip Hop New York Season 4, Episode 6, Recap, Review, and Opinion by Meat Magazine. This episode is titled Wife Swap. The episode starts out with Amina and Peter at Amina's apartment, and Amina is not happy about Yandy not wanting to sign her to her record label, Lennox Ave Records. To make matters worse, she is tired of being looked at by the public as being the reason why Tara and Peter kind of broke up. She feels that Peter is the home wrecker, not her, and that Yandy really let her down by psyching her up and then not signing her over Peter not being able to control himself. Amina wants Peter to act more like a husband instead of acting like a boyfriend. You see, Peter has been sleeping at his kid's house, as Amina puts it, better known as Tara's shoe-sized apartment. And Pete lets her know that he is not the type of guy to wine and dine a woman and run bath water and light candles for her. In other words, he's the opposite of me. So Amina, get used to it. It's just the way he is. If you don't like it, move on. Anyway, the best part of this scene is when Amina lifts up her arm and you can see a bucket of sweat all over her gray jersey cotton dress. And then the back of it is soaked too. Come to think of it, maybe it wasn't sweat at all. Ew. Moving along, now we're at Yummy Couture in the fashion district of New York. We're with Rashida and Tahiri. And fat ass Rashida looks like Ursula from The Little Mermaid. She has on an ugly dress that is aluminum foil, silver colored on the top, and white feathery, I just lost the pillow fight on the bottom. And that was the nicest description that I could come up with. It looks like a swan trying to commit suicide on an electric barbed wire fence. And what makes it worse is her hair. It's long and blonde on the top and orange on the bottom, like if Rapunzel got her period. But Tahiri isn't too far behind in crappy fashion because she is dressed like a couch. And if there is an afterlife, Tahiri is going to be covered with oil and sent to hell. She told this big baked potato looking heifer that even though she doesn't like the dress, she thinks that Rashida is quote perfect. I was going to make fun of Tahiri the liar and fake friend for saying this. However, she wants to marry Joe Budden, so that says everything about her that I could ever say. Tahiri is once again taking away from Rashida's happiness and happy times to bring the attention and focus back onto her selfish self. She can't be a friend of Rashida for one minute without mentioning Joe Budden and her problems with him. She's upset because she thought that she'd be married before Ra Rashida. Oh well, Tahiri, you won't be married before Rashida, but you will be divorced before her. I guess we can look out for Miss Desperate, aka Tahiri, to fight for the bouquet when it's thrown at Rashida's ratchet wedding. That's if she's invited. Now we're at WIP, W-I-P, at Hudson Square, and Yandy is chewing Rich out so badly, she wants him to find her some talent. He hasn't brought her anyone besides Erica Mena, and it's been months. Yandy told him that he is going to be an intern soon. The best part of the scene, however, is Yandy's costume. Yes, not an outfit, but a costume. She has this big honey bun on the top of her head with some gigantic snake-shaped earrings, which have ruined her ears. These fake heavy things stretched her ear until the bottom of her ear is now bigger than the top. Her ear now looks like Kay Michelle's pussy. Anyway, she has on a red belly shirt which reads, quote, rare, and a tight red skirt. But hey, if Yandy wants to look like a ghetto geisha, then that's her prerogative. I just hope that this episode was filmed on Halloween. I used to look at Yandy as being a very cool girl overall. I loved her drive as a businesswoman and Felt that she had a good attitude, but after this season, I'm not a fan of hers anymore at all. I find her little belly shirt having the word rare stamped on it to be ironic because Yandy looks more basic every episode. I now realize that Yandy is a hood rat in a mink coat. She just has the ability to sell herself very well. 
she should have been a lawyer. And in this scene, the way that she spoke to Rich Dollars was just wrong. Hopefully, these two, quote, business partners will break apart and they'll just work with people who they're more compatible to work with. So in the next scene, Peter takes his sons to the park to play basketball. Peter hasn't had a chance to see them very much. And uh, you could say that he's having the ball. I mean, it seems like Peter is always having a ball or, or, or serving balls to somebody. Anyway, they go back to the Hispanic Honda. I, I mean, Tara's home. And uh, Peter stays with the boys and decides to lay down. Later on, when the boys are asleep, Tara comes home stumbling and drunk and smelling of liquors. When she walks in the door, she sees Peter on his old bed, a.k.a. Tara's couch. And this fool has his filthy feet all up on it. Fuck yo couch. I'm talking straight up Rick James style. No respect. Anyway, at first I thought I saw clumps of dirt and toe jam. But after careful inspection, what appears to be dirt are actually rips and marks from Tara trying to run away from it. Trust me, chicks can rip stuff up trying to run away from it. Down, boy. Peter is spending a night on the dog bed, I mean sofa. And I am left with an important question. Does Tara usually go out and get drunk and leave the kids at home by themselves? Anyway, Peter lets Tara, who was wearing a white blouse, know that he wants her to lay down on that filthy outdoor furniture. He lets her know that if she lays on her back, he will stick his face in her like a lion tamer. I mean, give her some circles. <clears throat> I mean, she could use his face as a chair. Anyway, Tara plays hard to get and hops up barefoot. Don't ask me why she walk on the ground barefoot with glass and dog shit everywhere. Anyway, Tara hops up and walked one step into the bathroom and turned the water on and pretended that she was going to take a shower. Then she walks out of the bathroom all wet. And not from being in the shower either. She leaves the water on full blast and hops on the struggle sofa with Peter. And begins mud wrestling. Furiously. If I ever visit <laughs> you Tara, I'm going to get a tetanus shot. That couch looks like it's from a third world country. It's obviously been to war and lost. Anyway, Peter is the winner here. He sucked Tara's camel toe out of shape and beat it like Jesus. I'd hate to be her neighbors or her children that night. Tara needed it badly. She was about as frustrated as Fantasia at the library. So Peter gave it to her. Now we make a visit to Ursula's salon. K. Michelle is getting her filthy fake hair done and Paris, K. Michelle's fat manager, pops up. I wanted to puke looking at her because her neck is so fat it looks like she swallowed a donut and it got stuck in her throat. K. Michelle is telling Paris that Brianna, her former assistant that Paris hired, did not work out. She fired the young woman because she was a vegetarian and because she didn't have K. Michelle's cab on time for her after a meeting, causing Kimberly to suffer from being stuck in the rain with her hair dye streaming down her clothing. Brianna, wait a second, before I finish going into this, she was in the rain with her hair die dripping down her clothing I don't understand how that happens then again I'm a guy okay let me stop anyway Brianna stops by and attempts to make amends by bringing gifts to K. Michelle Brianna gives Kimberly Gatorade Jack Daniels and organic dog treats obviously major shade the Gatorade implies that Kimberly will be as fat as Paris from eating that sin food and that she needs to change her diet. The Jack Daniels was Brianna subliminally calling her a drunk. And finally, the dog treats were a passive aggressive way of calling her a bitch for firing her. Brianna made sure to tell her that even though they are for her dog, she can eat them as well. Mm hmm. You're not slick, Brianna. Come to find out, Fat Paris and K. Michelle are scared of Brianna because 
K. Michelle forced the vegetarian of four years to eat chicken, and the poor girl cried. And when a cab driver cursed her out, the girl cried again. This scares the evil K. Michelle and Donut Net Paris. K. Michelle beating her friends with flowers, Mimi, throwing candle wax on pregnant women, Rashida, hitting Carly Red in the forehead with utensils, etc., is all normal for these two trashy, nasty beasts. But Brianna's actions, such as crying, are just downright terrifying to them. Brianna, you can honestly do better. All that I know is K. Michelle won't be playing around with Erica Mena, Jocelyn Hernandez, or Chrissy Lampkin like that for obvious reasons. She's crazy, not stupid. Now we're at Battery Park City in the financial district of New York City. Tahiri is meeting up with her sister Lexi, and Lexi looks like the girl who auditioned for a dance hall music video in the 90s that was rejected. She looks like the island girl that you leave stranded on the island. Her hair looks like Raymond Noodles. She's wearing a faded black wife beater shirt and some ripped up slashed up jeans looking like she survived being raped by Freddy Krueger. What makes it worse is her tattoos. She has more tattoos than a Yakuza. She looks like a subway train in New York. Funky, beat up, worn out, and covered in graffiti. This is the nastiest looking bitch I've seen on VH1 thus far. Anyway, come to find out these two have not talked in five years. According to Lexi, their father has been kicked out of his house. And even though Tahiri speaks with her dad frequently, she didn't know because her head is nestled inside of Joe Budden's like an ostrich which Tahiri and her family curiously look like anyway after some crying and carrying on Tahiri hops up on her transsexual looking sister's lap and holds her ew that's just too fat too much fat for me for one scene moving along we make a quick visit to Washington Square Park Peter has so many women that when he walks up to his fake wife Amina with a bouquet of flowers she asks whether or not they're for her after a little bit of conversation and serenading Peter, Amina pulls out a box with two rings in it, one for her and one for him, and Peter doesn't want to wear his because he knows that this will upset his real wife, Tara. And with that said, Amina, Peter doesn't love you. I do. That's why I'm going to tell you the truth. You may be fine, and you may look like Aaliyah, but that acne on your forehead during this scene needs immediate attention. You should pull on the rings and get some proactive. Just saying. In the next scene, we are catching up with Tara and Kay Michelle. And Tara is looking her cutest in this scene. The pipe that Peter gave her must have given her that youthful glow. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. She just has a good makeup job this scene. With no makeup on, she looks like a little Indian boy. The gist of this scene inside of this Ford SUV is Tara is basically updating Kay Michelle at what's been going on with her, Amina, and Peter, and how she ended up sleeping with him on that raggedy couch that she found on the side of the road. That was about it. Now we're at Canyon Beach Wear at Upper East Side, New York City, and Erica Mena informs Sin Santana that they will be going to Panama to do their photo shoot for Erica's book. Erica lets her know that Rich is coming with them. As corny as Rich is to sin, she will take one for the team and go along with it for the trip. All Erica had to do to reel her in was cover the tip of her strap on with Chipotle. Now we have another filler scene here at VB3 in Jersey City, New Jersey. Rich lets Peter know that he wants Peter to manage Erica Mena, and Peter says that Erica is beautiful, and that he will sit down and meet her. He has never met her before, so he is down for the chance to talk with her. I think that Peter thinks that maybe he'll be able to smash and have, quote, angry sex with Erica Mena. If Peter gets Erica pregnant, I won't be surprised. You know, he's good for that. So now we're at Washington Heights in New York City. Tahiri and Lexi are walking down the street, brainstorming on how they could help their father out. The sisters are going to build a church for their father to live in and speak in. Come to find out he is close to losing his house, so this idea may, may save him. He didn't lose the house yet, so what do they have to lose? 
Oh, his house. Anyway, Lexi suggests that they start a fundraiser and auction themselves. And honestly, I wouldn't buy them if they were free. Tahiri is shaped like a bitten apple and Lexi is shaped like applesauce. So good luck at prostituting yourselves to build a church. You know, to scam the poor third world, third world country people. Their plan is that a fundraiser, as they call selling themselves, will pay for his church in no time. And this is why people hate Christianity. Just saying. Anyway, now we're at Yandy's office in Brooklyn. Yandy is meeting up with a rapper named Jay De Niro. De Niro means money in Spanish. Anyway, Jay Money, I mean Jay De Niro, raps for Yandy, and she is another corny, mediocre female rapper like L'Oreal. No talent whatsoever. And she isn't very good looking either. Jay De Niro has the same demeanor and the same lame storyline as Yandy does. The whole jailbird boyfriend thing going, you know. Now, if she plays her cards right, her corny Anne-Marie grandmother's looking ass will be on the show next week. Seeing that Yandy is all about making friends as opposed to making smart business decisions. And for the record, this funny faced chick looks like a cat wearing a wig. And that whack garbage that she wrapped won't sell on any planet. She should she should just find something else to do, like get some head. Seriously. She has almost no forehead. She has a little two head. Humans hair lines and eyebrows are not supposed to touch. Cat head looking mother with I mean, and then to top it off, she has these these big gigantic hands. Like she looks like she could stop a train with her hands. Anyway, the best part of the scene is when she stands up to hug Yandy before Yandy kicks her out of her office. Her outfit, it, I mean, her outfit is just freaking horrendous. So terrible clothing is something that her and Ken Yandy obviously have in common. I mean, you know, Yandy walks around looking like a dead peacock. In a ghetto geisha, and this chick looks like a gothic swimmer. You know, but maybe it was laundry day. I hope to God so. In our final scene, we pay a visit to Milk River in Brooklyn. Brooklyn. <laughs> Peter and Amina are meeting up with Rich and Erica Mena. Thirsty Rich is trying to help Peter earn some pedicure money. And as expected, the meeting with Peter and, uh, and Erica went bad really fast. Peter claims that the streets are not feeling Erica, which Peter would of course know all about because he's a homeless person and all, so he knows all about what's going on in the streets. He lives there. Erica lets Peter know that he's a clown according to the streets, blah blah blah. Next thing you know, after a bit of intense arguing and too many insults to cow, Erica throws a plate at Peter. To which Peter quickly responds, by throwing a glass, which completely misses Erica by a country mile. And I am left thinking about how these two nutcases remind me of Chris Brown and Drake, which would make Rich Rihanna, I guess. I hope that none of these actors, I mean patrons, in the background were hit with a glass. It looks like Peter should stick to aiming at ovaries. He never misses ovaries. Peter says that he wishes to never be placed in the same room as Erica again because she is disgusting. This is coming from a guy who never once in his life washed his feet and cheats on woman after woman. I love to know in detail what he considers to be disgusting. He might need to do some soul searching. I am for the record team Erica Mena. She is just too fine. Anyway, that was about it for this episode. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel and drop me a comment below.